From the Language App Babel, this is Multilinguish. I'm senior producer Steph Koifman. For nearly two centuries, the scientific community has known that something remarkable happens to patients who suffer from a stroke in the left half of their brain. These people can wind up with serious speech disorders when the stroke damages the language areas in the brain's left hemisphere, a condition known as non-fluent aphasia. But for some reason, their ability to sing remains intact. Okay, look, it's not just any reason. We're actually a lot closer to understanding why singing and speaking are two somewhat separate functions that rely on different brain mechanisms. But doesn't that make you kind of curious about that enigmatic piece of equipment that's sitting inside your skull? We take this stuff for granted all the time, but what exactly goes on in your head when you're speaking a language? What happens when you learn a new one? Or forget your mother tongue as you age in another country? Does reading braille require different parts of your brain than reading text on a page? Why does the aphasia patient sing? In this episode, we'll deconstruct the parts of the brain that make language possible by quite literally bringing them to life. Then we'll explore the various ways things can go wrong in the brain as a means of getting closer to the mystery. But don't worry, we'll try to keep it fun and light too. Before we get started, a reminder to rate and review Multilinguish wherever you listen, and be sure you're subscribed so you get new episodes as soon as they're released. You can probably visualize a brain right now if I asked you to, right? You're good with that image of a wrinkly, pinkish, intestinal-looking thing that sits on a stalk? Am I going to lose you if I start throwing out words like temporal lobe and insular cortex? Would it help if you visualized it kind of like a pomegranate instead, where there are two distinct halves but also clusters of seeds within those halves that are attached to a sort of filmy connective tissue? It's not a perfect analogy, but it kind of works. You can think of the seeds as the gray matter in the brain, which is made up mostly of neurons, and the connective tissue is the white matter, which extends out from and supports the cells in the gray matter. The white matter is basically like a fiber track that connects different parts of the brain like a system of telephone wires, carrying electrical signals between different parts of the brain. If you were actually looking at a human brain, you'd see mostly gray matter in the outer layer and white matter underneath it. The outer layer with all the gray matter is also known as the cerebral cortex, which is where a lot of the smarty pants stuff happens in our brains. You know, stuff like thought, consciousness, memory, language. Both the right half and the left half are involved in language, but the right hemisphere is sort of the more creative, artsy sibling of the left hemisphere, who stays late after school for math club. It's like, whatever, man. No, I actually don't know what that means. The right hemisphere is generally thought to be involved in the non languagey parts of language, if that makes sense. Things like rhythm, intonation, reading emotional cues, picking up on sarcasm, reading body language, humor. What I'm saying is it's not what you say, it's how you say it. It's like a right hemisphere thing you wouldn't understand. Look, I swear I'm not trying to upset you. When I say things like, Put the shoes away before mom gets home. That's literally what I mean. I'm not implying anything about how much you ate or that I'm mad at you. The right hemisphere is what we use to read between the lines and infer things beyond the literal meaning of words. Patients with right hemisphere lesions often struggle to answer questions about a text that require them to put it all together, if that makes sense. But the left hemisphere does do a lot of the heavy lifting. That's right. I do a lot of the heavy lifting. The left half of the brain is basically language central for things like vocabulary, grammar, and processing sounds, but it's not quite as cut and dried as it sounds. Every person's brain develops differently, so the two halves of the brain don't always split the load of language processing the same way. Even something like being right-handed or left-handed can influence how your right brain and left brain work together to produce language. And actually, people who grow up bilingual tend to experience a more even distribution across the two hemispheres. This is something that's referred to as bilateral activation. Typically, language processing is lateralized mostly to the left hemisphere. But if that part of the brain is, I don't know, say injured, then the right hemisphere can also compensate for that a bit. So you see what I mean when I say it's kind of complicated. Okay, but having said all of that, the left hemisphere has a lot of moving parts that we'll need to get to know to understand how this all works. There's a spot kind of close to your left temple called the Broca's area. Hi, Broca's area. What up, what up? I'm Broca, but you can call me Bro for short. I'm the guy in charge of planning speech production, like getting you to the point where you can actually talk and stuff. But I also help you understand words, too. Basically, I take thoughts and I help put them into words by telling the broskies over in the motor cortex what steps they need to take so that you can actually talk and stuff. 
They call that motor control in the fancy science books. But down here, we just call that leg day. When there's damage to the Broca's area, patients can lose the ability to speak or write fluently. Or they might still be able to produce basic nouns, but lose the ability to string it together grammatically. Another major player is the Wernicke's area, which is next to the Broca's area, but a little further to the back of your head. Here's Wernicke. Hello, pleased to make your acquaintance. I'm Mr. Wernicke. I like to sit in my armchair and philosophize about semantics. You can't actually comprehend language without me because I'm the one in charge of assigning context and meaning to words. Look, I don't make the rules, so don't shoot the messenger. No, like, literally though, if I get hurt or injured, you'll wind up sounding like you're speaking in a way that makes sense because your intonation, gestures, and sentence length sound right. But if you actually listen to the words, it would just sound like gibberish. So Broca and Wernicke might have different jobs, but they're super close, as in they text each other 24-7. They're actually connected by a bundle of white matter called the arcuate fasciculus. Yep, that's me, the arcuate fasciculus. I spend all day, every day, being misinformation superhighway and getting these two on the same page. It's exhausting, but someone's got to do it. And anyway, I like to get involved in everything. Like, just everything about language is super interesting to me. I do verbal working memory, and scientists think I might have a role in helping you learn new vocabulary. But basically, I'm the reason you have such instant coordination between the part of your brain that says the word and the part of your brain that hears and recognizes the word. A little further back behind the Veronica's area is the angular gyrus, which is involved in a number of complex language processes. Picture me taking a slow drag on a cigarette. I'm sort of a jack of all trades, an association man. I allow you to associate a word with your mental image of that thing, or a sensation it causes, or broader concepts and ideas. It's believed that I'm responsible for understanding metaphors. I also do number processing, spatial recognition, memory retrieval, and some cool tricks that help you pay attention. So these are just the main characters, but there are many other components of your central nervous system that play a role whenever you read, write, speak, or listen. For instance, reading. First, the optic nerve would send information from your eyes to the visual cortex. That's assuming you can see, of course. If you're reading Braille, the sensory cortex would receive the input you get from your fingertips. But different areas of the brain then immediately activate in the blink of an eye, working together kind of like a symphony. It's never one part of the brain doing anything in isolation. For reading, these include white matter pathways in the brain, which connect the back of the brain's reading network to the front and temporal lobe, which handles phonological awareness, or the recognition of the sound structures of language. That is I. Wernicke's area is part of the temporal lobe. Broca here. I know I'm the speech production guy, but don't forget, language comprehension is kind of my side hustle. You know, though, give some points to me and my companion, the supramarginal gyrus. Us gyri link things together in your brain so that you can make sense of letter shapes. Otherwise, it'd just be a jumble of letters that you don't even recognize as words. Okay, so let's take writing as another example. You'd have the frontal lobe involved as part of the planning process, as in figuring out what you want to write about and how you're going to approach it. Your hippocampus would then get to work retrieving information in your long-term memory. Yeah, and Broke is the guy who turns your memories into words. You know, the little voice in your head that helps you narrate stuff? Don't mention it. Yes, but every good writer needs an editor. That's why Wernicke steps in to make it all make sense. No offense. The visual cortex also gets involved to process the visual associations you have when you're looking at the words on the page. And the motor area in your frontal lobe would be responsible for helping you carry out the motor functions of writing or typing. And then things get even more interesting when you add more languages into the mix. Brains are not only complex, but they exhibit plasticity, which basically means they're capable of structurally changing and rewiring themselves to adapt to our experiences over time. Second language learning is something that research has shown to contribute to positive brain changes, no matter when in life you do it. Bilingualism actually leads to more gray matter in your brain, as well as increased levels of white matter integrity. So it's kind of a win-win all around. People who are lifelong bilinguals show enhanced network activity in their prefrontal and parietal regions, which leads to greater cognitive control. Basically, you wind up having a stronger ability to filter out unnecessary information and tune out distractions. It kind of makes sense given that you're constantly switching between languages. It's like doing push-ups for your brain. Okay, and get this. One of the most exciting things that we've learned about bilingualism is that it might create what's called a cognitive reserve, which is basically like a rainy day fund for your mind. Essentially, it builds your brain's resistance to the ravages of time and aging. 
This could mean anything from delaying the onset of dementia and Alzheimer's to increasing your chances of recovering after a stroke. Anyway, you get the point. There are so many moving parts that cooperate to help you produce, understand, and learn language, and the brain itself is kind of a moving target. It's a lot, but then you kind of have to take a step back and really consider and appreciate what a sophisticated and elegant thing it is. This thing called language. Hey, it's Thomas. Multilingual is brought to you by Babbel, the language app. Our marketing team wants you to know that we offer an app that teaches you 14 languages. From Spanish, French, and Italian to Portuguese, Russian, and more, Babbel's app is created by real language teachers and experts. You'll learn how to have conversations in real life situations, whether you need to greet your neighbors in Turkey or play chess against the embodiment of death in Sweden. We're offering multilingual listeners 50% off a three month subscription. New customers can get this offer by visiting babbel.com slash podcast. That's B A B B E L dot com slash podcast. Now, back to the show. Most of what we know about the brain when it comes to language comes from situations where the brain is not necessarily working as it should, which is often due to an injury. So this isn't the case so much anymore, but it was for a long time before we had advanced medical imaging like MRIs. Actually, the most famous example of this involved the discovery of the Broca's and Wernicke's areas. So in 1861, French neurologist Pierre-Paul Broca discovered a lesion in the brain of a deceased patient who was unable to speak, but who didn't have any readily apparent motor impairments when the original symptoms appeared. So that was how they made the connection between the Broca's area and what it does. And then a couple years later, in 1867, Carl Wernicke had a case on his hands where the patient could speak but was not able to actually understand the language. So later he was able to locate where the damage existed in the brain, and you could probably guess the rest. We have better technology to do our research now, but we can still learn a lot about the way that the brain functions by exploring unusual case studies or examples of how the brain sometimes works in ways that we don't expect. Here with me right now are producer David Duchin and VP and head of content Jen Jordan, and we're about to break into a game of multiple choice trivia. So if you're listening at home, feel free to play along and put your new cognitive brain science knowledge to the test. Hi, David. Hi, Jen. Hi, Sam. Hey, everyone. How is everyone? Doing well. Ready to get my mental gear spinning. Awesome. Revved. I feel like I can relate to the being able to speak but not understanding what's happening. Yeah, it's it's been that kind of day. Um, so are you guys ready for the first question? Bring it on. I hope so. Okay. So aphasia is a term that describes speech impairments that are caused by brain damage. My question to you, why can aphasia patients sometimes sing but not speak? Um, is it A, because the parts of the brain that most support speaking are in a different half of the brain than the parts that most support singing? Is it B, it's actually not so much about singing as it is speaking with a rhythm. Or C, it's actually not so much about singing as it is speaking with a rhythm and relying on your memory for well-known song lyrics. So David, let's confer here. You know that singing helps you remember things, right? Of course. So it's got to and... be A or B, right? I don't Because it has nothing to do with song lyrics. That's obviously a red herring designed to throw us off. Well, I think of, you know how... Alzheimer's patients and or dementia patients, I'm not sure which one, but they often can't remember much about the major and minor details of their lives, but they connect with music uh, from mm -hmm. their past yeah. as like a form of therapy. Um, I've seen those really, really heartbreaking, but also heartwarming videos of, of um, these patients who can remember every single lyric to and the melody to the songs they used to sing as children, but nothing else. And that makes me think that it might be C. If I remember C correctly, it's that that singing has a lot to do with um, with memory and not just the lyrics and the melody. Was that yeah. was that actually yes. the right choice? So C was that it has to do with the rhythm and the memory. Interesting. So then what do you think? So what was, can you repeat A and B again for me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so A was um, that the parts of the brain that support singing and speaking are in different halves, so you're using a different half of your brain. And then B was that it's not about the singing as it is about the rhythm. Hmm. And C was the, it's about... Both speaking and memory. Or, sorry, both rhythm and memory. 
well, for the man memory. Now, David, you have me convinced it's got to be C. Well, now I'm worried that it's not C and I'm, <laughs> I just took you down the wrong path. Uh, but there's, there's no wrong path. It all leads to learning. It's not about the destination. It's about the journey. Yeah. I'm going to be a contrarian and just say it's A. They're in different halves of the brain because if one half of your brain is busted, the other side is still able to pick up the slack. Mm-hmm. Final answer. Is that how we're playing this? Final answer. Are we a yeah. team, Jen, or are we competing against each other? No, there's no competition. <laughs> We started out as a team, but now I'm going off on my own. <laughs> She's going rogue. Would it, would it make you guys feel better if you won a prize at the end? Just, just your I always feel respect. better when I won a prize, so can't say no to that. So, I'm going to stick with C. Jen's going with A. I okay. feel like David's right. Is, is that your final answer? Final answer locked in. <laughs> okay, David, you're right. Ugh, yeah. I knew it. <laughs> David's always right. Well, I mean, he has a linguistics background, so it's <laughs> kind of fair. <laughs> Linguists are always right. Yeah. Okay, so Jen, to be fair, for a long time we did assume that it was because they were using a different half of their brain, but um, we only learned like as recently as 2011 that, um, or I guess we there was some new research that came out in 2011 that kind of suggested that maybe it's actually not so much about singing, but um, the rhythm and the formulaic nature of song lyrics, um, because. There was a study done by German researchers, and they basically had the subjects repeat these formulaic phrases like, how are you, that were kind of used to saying, or like saying things in a really rhythmic way. And they had the same results as if they were singing. So that's interesting. Yeah. So basically, that's kind of, um, that's kind of changed like the prevailing theory around why people can sing but not speak sometimes. I'm ready to redeem myself. (laughs) Okay. Don't take it so hard. Um, okay, so next question. Why do our brains remember certain words over others? A, we're more likely to remember the words that we learned as children because that information is stored in a different part of the brain. B, the brain is constantly discarding memories that are similar to memories it's competing for space with. So it's kind of a use it or lose it situation. Or C, our brains latch onto sounds that we were exposed to early in the womb. Ooh, this one's a good question. I'm trying to think of learning, even as a child, vocabulary that I've long since forgotten because maybe I wasn't a child child. Maybe I was more late elementary school or middle school, but there are words that I learned back in the day or I had to commit to memory for a test that I've completely forgotten right now. And I feel like, I feel like I'm leaning towards B for that reason. It's like, If I'm not constantly refreshing my memory on the usage of a word in different contexts, then it's just going to be pushed out um, because my brain only has so much capacity. Mm -hmm. I also I also think of like learning foreign languages. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I can think of a word in Spanish, but I can't actually think of its translation in English. And I'm a native English speaker. Yeah. And if I'm just practicing Spanish more often or practicing a certain set of words or vocabulary, I'm probably more likely to remember that word over the English one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm torn between A and B. I, I mean, C is a throwaway because you can't hear anything in the womb. It's all muffled. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Maybe that's not entirely true. Don't, I'm not a a noted neurologist or memory expert of any kind, actually. (laughs) Um, I do think it's interesting about the the fact that maybe we're storing long-term memories in a different part of our brain than short-term memories because in my experience, languages I studied early on, like French, when I took other languages, like in college I took Russian, I would forget the Russian word and accidentally substitute the French word in its place, which is very confusing because English is my first language. And I wasn't yeah. I was I wasn't thinking of the English word, I was thinking of the French word. Yeah. And I'm wondering if that's because my brain was just pulling like the next available word that it knew I had learned. Um, but I also think if you don't use it, you do lose it at a certain point. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's the whole space repetition. Thing. Yeah. I do like this friendly little competition that David and I have. So if he's going with B, I think I'm going to go with A. What? Jen, don't let me force you out of choosing what you, yeah, what your this heart isn't tells like, you is true. This isn't like going to a restaurant where you can't both order the same thing. I just always want to share. Um, no, I do. I do think, I think 
a I'm probably shooting myself in the foot because I'm I'm guessing maybe there's not separate parts of the brain that we're completely compartmentalizing. But um, I'm going to say it's a because of my experience learning French first and then Russian and being constantly confused between the two. Okay, so it's B. (laughs) (laughs) Of course it is. (laughs) <laughs> um, i warned you jen i warned you okay. well it's actually so sometimes we do randomly remember things and it has nothing to do with repetition and like sometimes you know our brains will latch on to something that has like seemingly very little like um just like some sort of random word or memory um and that actually tends to happen during emotionally charged events because stress hormones like epinephrine and cortisol actually cement memories in our brains. But generally speaking, our brains are always trying to be really efficient about storage and they'll be like trying to make room for the words that we do use frequently by tossing out the ones that we don't use. Is this why I remember things in our teenage years so much more clearly because it's just such a traumatic, stressful time in our lives? I think so. Yeah. I think the house, yeah, like every, every day seemed longer when we were younger because everything was just such a shock. Man, I wonder how much of 2020 we're going to remember because it's going to be yeah. it's a real trip. I don't know about you. I'm trying to black out the entire experience yeah. and just pretend it never existed. Will it work? <laughs> Only time will tell, but we'll see. Um, well, Jen, I do I do also want to kind of like back up your reasoning because um, bilinguals do experience more tip of the tongue moments than monolingual people, which is when like they might struggle to remember a word that they want to use. Um but a little interesting tidbit is that based on research, we're pretty sure that this isn't about sound, but more about the concept of the word because um, people who speak sign language go through the same thing. So that's kind of interesting. Interesting. All right. I feel slightly better about my my explanation here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Are you ready for the next question? I'm okay Let's with being wrong it. because I'm learning. It's fine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, okay. Most of the brain's main language... It, Um, most of the brain's main language processing centers are located in the left hemisphere. So why is the right hemisphere also important when it comes to language learning? A, it plays an important role in helping learners familiarize themselves with the basic sounds and acoustic details of a language. B, it helps you pick up on nonverbal communication like body language and emotional cues. Or C, it helps you register tone, which is especially important for tonal languages like Mandarin. Ooh. I mean, we know stereotypically, if you're right brained, you're more like artistic or able to express yourself. Isn't that generally the stereotype? Yeah, it is. So theoretically, it would be, I don't know, it could be any of them. Steph, you made these really hard. <laughs> I'm sorry. I feel like I feel like I wasn't about to toss you guys any softballs with this. <laughs> I, I want to know like what I'm David getting... thinks first, and then I'll tell you. <laughs> I feel like I'm getting PTSD from like the verbal section of the SAT or something, where the, all of them could be right if you really think about it, but only one is the best answer. My thoughts on this one are, Jen, I'm with you on the like the right brain. I've always heard that people who are right brained are more creative, artistic, whatever, and that makes me think maybe a like the sounds and pitches have to do with musicality, and I generally think of people who are really right-brained and creative as being more in touch with their musical sides i mean this is all based on just like Mm -hmm. the the urban legends that we've all heard since the beginning of time i don't know how true they are but that seems like it checks out to me i'm hesitant about c because tonal languages not every language is a tonal language so Mm -hmm. it seems like that part of the brain would only be used um, or like unlocked if you're speaking a tonal language like Chinese or Thai or Vietnamese or some something that we don't speak. It, uh, I have a hard time believing that. Well, I should I should say brain. that when I say it helps you register tone, I don't only mean like in in the context of a tonal language, like tone as in can you tell if someone's being sarcastic? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Like some people yeah. just aren't good at detecting right. sarcasm. And um, don't and don't also don't don't be afraid to think outside of the box. It could be more than one. Is it all three? Yes. <laughs> oh my god, stop. That's not fair. I was gonna try to make a case for for B, 
but I was like, all of these are sounding very related to me. <laughs> well, you guys were both kind of inclined to say that anyway. So I'm sorry that I hit you with a trick question, but it is all of the above. I feel so much that better now sense. for getting her one. I get one right. <laughs> well, I, that makes me think of how language is so much more than just the content of the words that we speak. It's yeah. like the, yeah, I mean, emotional um, expression and body language and facial cues are so important. And I don't know what the statistic is, but I remember reading somewhere, maybe we talked about it on multilinguish before, that up to 90% of language is nonverbal cues or non-linguistic mm -hmm. cues. So like everything outside of the actual content, the words, but more of the infrastructure of language and how we convey meaning yeah. uh, outside of the just speech sounds. So that all makes sense, but I'm a little bit salty, I'm not going to lie, that you didn't tell us and you made us really really strain our brains <laughs> trying to choose just one i'm so sorry i know that was kind of evil um it's okay we all learned yeah but it's actually kind of interesting too because um there's been research that's shown that the right brain is especially active in the beginning when you're engaged in like the sound recognition process and um they found that the study participants who had more of that right brain activation ended up being more successful in the long run so sorry, when you're Dave. <laughs> when you're when you're conversing with somebody or communicating i mean it sounds like a lot of your brain is lit up at that point mm -hmm. that's pretty amazing i would think it would be only a, a small section no i mean it's i feel like it's um there's so many different parts of your brain that have to um work together in tandem to make communication happen yeah you're like problem solving you're yeah. improvising you're active listening yeah I probably um, should have used more parts of my brain for this quiz. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I lost David's trust forever. Um, no stuff. I'll always put my trust in you. Okay. All right. So no more trick questions, though. Um, are you ready for the next one? Please. Okay. When first language attrition occurs in the brain, and I should just define for anyone who doesn't know, first language attrition is when someone primarily speaks in a second or third language and they begin to lose fluency in their first language as they get older. So when first language attrition occurs in the brain, which of these language aspects tends to fade from memory first? Is it A, the grammatical structure of the language, B, the vocabulary, or C, the phonology or the sound? I want to say it's vocab only because of anecdotal stories of our coworkers who speak English all day and all week and then speak their native language and forget words. Yeah. I think this is a story Ruben told us one time or told me at some point. Yeah, that checks out to me. I've heard stories like that. Um, in linguistics classes, I've also learned a little bit about this phenomenon. And I think it's, I think when you learn a language or you, I think linguists like to sit, talk about acquiring a language because a lot of learning in air quotes, learning your first language is actually way more subconscious than, you know, you're not sitting down and taking notes and, and taking tests and learning vocab. It just all comes to you. Yeah. And I think that a lot of it has to do with the fact that like grammar structures, I think option B or maybe option a it, they're more inherent and locked in than vocab which are kind of vocab words are the pieces that fit into that structure um and it seems like it's more of a use it or lose it situation with those two like the the this grammatical structure of a language is something that is less likely to leave you because it's so embedded in your like neural network mm -hmm. um but the vocab you only really learn vocab when you pick it up from the environment, someone else in your life using a word. Um, and it doesn't seem to stick as much, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, so you're we both agree. right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So the answer is Good job, B. David. Um, yeah. Like you both said, knowledge of grammar and phonology tends to remain more stable. Um, yeah. We, I mean, so we talked about how like bilinguals tend to experience more tip of the tongue moments than monolingual people, right? Because they have these two words that mean the same thing that are competing for space. Um, but the the phonology or the sound tends to be a lot more ingrained. And that's actually one of the reasons why it's so hard to lose your accent as an adult. Um, but basically you have this like, like 
sound map that your baby brain started creating like pretty much as soon as you were born and like the older you get the more ingrained it gets so um that's why that's why usually like the last frontier the last hurdle for a lot of people is nailing their accent it makes sense yeah um okay are you ready for the last question as ready as i'm gonna be (laughs) okay why do some head trauma patients wind up involuntarily speaking in foreign languages they may have studied long ago with seemingly perfect accents out of nowhere? Is it A, the trauma stimulated blood flow to their limbic system, activating stored memories? B, it's a form of dissociative identity disorder where the native language identity splits off and goes into hiding? Or C, the injury was to a region of their brain where native language knowledge is stored, causing another part of the brain to take over where second language knowledge is stored. So I'm tempted to say it's not A, just because I don't think all trauma events are the same. Mm -hmm. So to say that every single trauma event, whether it's physical or emotional, I guess we're talking physical trauma to the brain, right? Yeah. I don't know if every single physical trauma that happens to the brain would redirect blood flow to a separate part of the brain. Um, But I think that it's B. I mean, I don't know. Because what B we're talking about more of like a a personality sort of consequence. Mm -hmm. Um, And I guess C we're talking about more of like a physicality, like an anatomical consequence. Mm -hmm. Um, And that makes me think like every traumatic event that happens to someone's brain isn't going to be anatomically similar to someone else's so it's like how do we know what actually happens to the tissue in the brain like it just seems more likely to me that there's this dissociative response that is measurable outside of like a a physical injury none of none of what i said just made sense but i'm trying to think it makes sense it makes sense um i mean i i'm leaning towards uh I think it was C, the one where your the injury damaged a part of your the place in your brain where you have your native language stored. Right. Only because we know that people with traumatic brain injuries, I mean, some people are able to lose large parts of their brain and their brain starts to pick up uh, slack from other areas that may be damaged or missing. So we know that the brain can compensate for other areas. And I'm wondering if Maybe that could be what's happening here. I would also like to offer option D, which is you want to assume a new identity in the mm-hmm. in the mid century. This seems like a really good way to do it. Um, <laughs> so I think that would be the more fun answer that I would prefer. But if yeah. we have to choose from the above, I'm going to go with C, just to be different from David, which means it's probably wrong. No, I actually think that I'm going to stick with B, just because that was my first intuition. But I think. Jen, you have a good chance of being right on this one. So, Jen, you just redeemed yourself. Yes. Oh, darn. <laughs> oh, thank God. <laughs> um, so this is sometimes referred to as foreign accent syndrome, um, but a more technical term is bilingual or polyglot aphasia. So we talked about aphasia already, right, which is, you know, it's damage to any part of the brain's language cortex. But it's interesting because it can really play out in a handful of ways and, like, yeah, who says you can't suddenly wake up from a head injury speaking a language that you studied in high school. Um, but yeah, so basically the languages that you learn as a small child are generally not going to be stored in the same area where your second language is. And depending on how it kind of shakes out, um, patients can sometimes involuntarily switch between languages or they might only be able to speak one language at a time. But yeah, it's super interesting. That's pretty amazing. That seems, yeah, crazy to me. Yeah. I understand, I guess, how it works, but the thought that like all of these repressed memories, I guess you could call them repressed memories, are just waiting to be unlocked and it takes some sort of traumatic event to do that. Yeah. Um, we just normally, really weird. I mean, normally it's such a small portion of our brain. It's pretty incredible, like the studies they've done in terms of like how you can unlock different parts of your brain and use different parts. It's crazy. We could that was the plot of the movie Limitless, wasn't it? Like unlock, what if you can unlock 100% of your brain? I don't think I saw that. I actually didn't see it either, but <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's the one, it's like the famous clip of Morgan Freeman being like, what if you could unlock 100% of your brain? 
It I don't sounds know. like one of those um, bad pickup lines that like a pickup artist would use at a bar. Did you know we only use 10% of our brain? <laughs> I don't know who's hitting <laughs> on you, Steph, but that? it's much more cerebral than my experience has been. <laughs> Anyway, um, thank you guys so much for joining me today. Um, and thank you for straining to match or uh, follow along with my deceitful ways. It was pretty no, fun. I, I appreciate the the cunning and the, the tomfoolery. It kept me on my toes. But now my my brain, I feel like I'm going through some sort of aphasia. This was a, a brain strain and now I need to rest up so I can actually use language effectively again. Okay, well, I'll let you go. Thanks so much, Steph. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Steph. It was Bye. fun, David. Multilinguish is a production of the Language App Babel. This episode was produced by me, Steph Koifman, with help and special cameos from Jen Jordan, Deanna Tour, Dylan Lyons, David Duchin, and Thomas Devlin. Editing and sound design is by Brian Rosado. Special thanks to Babel Didactics experts Cornelia Laman and Taylor Hermerding for sharing their linguistic expertise with us for this episode. You can read about today's episode topic and more on Babbel Magazine. Just visit B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash magazine. Say hi on social media by finding us at Babbel USA. Finally, please rate and review this podcast. We really appreciate it. Welcome to the multiple choice. Multiple oh, choice. Turn it around. <laughs> I didn't know we were doing that right now. Let's try it again. Okay. Welcome, Welcome to the, to the multiple, multiple choice, choice trivia round. I don't know if we should keep that. <laughs> <laughs> that can be in the in the bloopers. <laughs> <laughs>